I guess from very early days of my being able to drive, I was interested, as many young guys are, in driving as quickly as possible. Uh, I suppose I satisfied that need by driving up through the hills and then the opportunity to came up to help out another guy, the driver, who was uh, he'd built this special car, this Porsche, that he wanted to get into a rally, and he decided that uh, Adelaide Hills Tarmac Rally was a two-and-a-half-day event that would be a good starting event for him. And I said to him, look, you know, if you need a navigator, I'm, I know how the events work and I know the roads, and so there's an opportunity there if you like. And he eventually said, yeah, yeah let's do it. The car that the driver had built was a Porsche 911, RS. It was normally aspirated, not turboed, um, but he'd spent a good bucket of money on it and it looked fantastic. Uh, yeah, hadn't spared any expense as far as wheels and brakes and tyres. It really looked quite schmick and it was a very quick car. I remember getting to the start queue. We were sitting in the queue and I looked up at the hills where we were headed and it was black up there, absolutely awful looking weather. So I remember swinging the door open and swinging my legs out of the Porsche to climb out, and that's the last thing I remember. Um, the driver's wife and I were spectating on a stage that um, the boys were due to come through on in a little while, and uh, there was quite a period there where there weren't any cars coming through, and we were standing next to the... Um, marshals for that particular stage and um, my phone rang and I thought oh this will be Jason to tell us that um, you know something's happened and they've been held up or whatever else. We basically tucked in very very close to the side of the road on the inside of the corner there was a bank on the inside I think the driver had just cut it a little bit tight and the, the rear wheel clipped the bank. It was rally control and um, they told me that there had been um, a serious accident um, involving the car. It was a very quick corner. We were probably doing 120 kilometres an hour. Um, and at that point, there was a very sharp crest. And I think what's happened, I believe, um, is the car's got a bit sideways. He's corrected it as you do, trying to get a bit of opposite lock on. And at that point, the car's left the ground. And then when, when it's landed, it's landed with the wheels crossed up and gone straight around the other way, oversteered around and gone off the road to the left and hit the tree on my side. Uh, what was going through your mind when you found out? Um, sorry. That's right, we can stop. I'm extremely lucky to be talking to you now. I'm extremely lucky to be talking to you now. Um, I, I do remember, again, the strange dark dream with sounds of power equipment or power saws or something like that, and I'm just lying there thinking, this is really strange. What, what the hell is this going on? What am I dreaming about? You know. I remember a deep thrumming noise and kerosene fumes, which I think now was probably the helicopter. But I don't remember any of that really very clearly at all. They pinned my left leg, um, so they, they opened it up and stuck a pin up my left leg to stabilise that. Um, they obviously, I identified that my neck was, neck bones were cracked, um, so they stabilised that. And at, the, and at that time they didn't know how to handle my right leg, it was that bad. I broke bones through my face, I hit the tree here um, and broke bones through my face, I broke my neck, C2 vertebrae, um, busted ribs, punctured lung, um, because the seat collapsed when we hit the tree, it crashed my pelvis and cracked my pelvis through the middle, uh, broke my left leg and through the thigh bone and the right leg twice through the thigh bone in two places and then the lower leg bone smashed the joint up totally at the knuckle bone at the top. The major damage was to my right leg, which is where the tree impacted the car most. All I could really think about was, I hope he doesn't die, basically. That's, that's what I was thinking. Um, I was willing him not to. Um, I spent nearly four weeks in Flinders um, and then moved uh, up to Hampstead and went into the ortho ward there where I uh, yeah, learned how to hop along on one leg and then start bearing weight on the other leg. And the rehabilitation is ongoing even now. But as far as structured rehabilitation, it went through to November last year. That was you know, 18 months, basically. It was, it was time. I'd, I'd, you know, I'd got to the point at Hampstead where I felt that I'd done everything I could do anyway and I was ready to go home. And I desperately needed a beer. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the tradition was when I was in competition that at the end of every day you'd have a beer. Also, I'd gone like 10 weeks without a finishing beer for that event and, uh, 
yeah, coming home was was really good. It was a bit emotional, but uh, yeah, I sat out in the back veranda and looked out over the lawn and had my beer and said, "Now I'll finish the event." And uh, yeah, it was good to get home, be in your own space. Ever since I first saw one in the eighties, my dream car has always been a nineteen seventy one Dodge Challenger. I think the the restoration of the car has been quite an important thing for Jason. I think it's given him um, an opportunity to focus on achieving something that uh, he's been wanting to get finished for a long time. It's certainly ticked a couple of boxes there as far as giving me a goal. It's been physically therapeutic in that it's caused him to put his leg and his body into positions that... um, you know, were quite difficult for him from time to time. As soon as I got home, it was like I went out to the shed, I think, the following day, and what what can I do while I'm out here? And I think I'm still on crutches at that time. And, uh, yeah, so it was a matter of deciding what I could do, and I had to go and get a couple of bits and pieces organised so that I could actually spend any time out there without standing up and things like that. Squeezing yourself into tight spaces, working in the back seat, you know, putting carpets in and fixing things down and things like that. It's it's not a big car to get into. So things like that were, were challenging physically and certainly kept me bending a lot more than I probably would have done if I hadn't had the reason to. The guy's name was Matt Conklin. He lived in Alhambra, California. Um, he bought the car new in 1971. Uh, drove it till about 74 and then sold it to his dad because insurance premiums went through the roof and he couldn't afford to insure it anymore so his dad drove it till about 1982. Uh, This is a 383 Magnum engine in this car, that's a 6.3 litre V8. Uh, They used a lot of high performance parts out of the larger 440 engine and it puts out, a. I think the factory rating on these was about 335 horsepower. Um, so it's pretty respectable in a straight line. Yeah, going around corners is a bit more of a challenge as with most American cars. I'm uh, proud of his um, having got it finished after quite some time of having it. And uh, yeah, I love travelling around in the Challenger. It's fabulous, especially when you put your foot down. We've managed to drive it up and down the street, uh, just checking it out, making sure all the brakes worked. And I think we finished the brakes off, That's just, that sort of stuff. We put all the seats in, the seat belts in. Um, finished off the interior trim, got the exhaust system fitted, put the wheels on it, um, finally tidied everything up. I I had three pages worth of things to do. Could you get rid of the car now? After everything it's been through with you? I'd be very surprised if he ever made a decision like that. I can't imagine he would ever do that. If someone came up and offered me a million dollars, I'd be crazy not to take it. At the end of the day, it's his car and it's his decision, but, um, yeah, I'd be um, I'd be surprised and disappointed. I will probably put it in a couple of show shows in the near future and uh, see how it goes. Not expecting anything, but, I, yeah, I will put it in a couple of comps for more for other people to see it than for my benefit. respect of rally. Um, motorsport is always dangerous, um, but I would recommend to anybody that's looking at going into a rally that they have all the possible safety gear they can get and don't overstretch themselves initially. You always drive with at least two tenths in reserve, because if you think you're driving with two tenths in reserve, you've probably only got one in reserve, and you never know when something crazy might happen. It is a very dangerous form of motorsport and I mean you need all the protection you can get under those circumstances. Mm-hmm.